autumn in New York. Why does it feel so inviting? It's autumn in New York that spells the thrill of first nighting. Those glittering crowds and shimmering clouds in canyons of steel. They're making me feel that I'm home. It's autumn in New York that brings the promise of a new love. Is often mingled with pain. Those dreamers of empty hands, they will sigh for exotic lands. It's autumn in New York. I. Good evening and welcome to St. Peter's. What a gift to be together this evening for this service of light and music and prayer. For those of you who are joining us from your homes, welcome to you as well. We're coming to you from St. Peter's Church at 54th Street and Lexington Avenue. And should you happen to be in our city in these weeks ahead, we very much invite you to join us. We're here every Sunday evening at five o'clock. Perhaps even at home, you will now participate as we will hear in lighting a candle. Jazz Vespers is celebrated as the sun sets and we light a candle in our midst to symbolize the presence of God with us. We say together, God's light shines. A promise of mercy, a word of grace.
Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O God, and let your loving kindness descend upon us, that with purified hearts we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host, and may glorify you forever and ever. Amen. A reading from St. Luke. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, The axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. And they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we? What should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them, saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquestionable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. Señor, mi Piritus. 
That song, we call it the Magnificat, from its first words in its Latin version, or the Song of Mary, is the song in St. Luke's Gospel that I think gives us the key to the entire Gospel. It's a song about a world in incredible disarray. And Mary, when she learns that she is to bear Jesus, the Word of God, she sings. She sings, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And goes on to talk about how God will turn the power, the powers of the world on their heads. Will send the rich away empty. Will fill the hungry with good things. And I'm struck that that song, which is really the key to all of St. Luke's gospel, how it interacts with the story of John the Baptizer, which we read tonight. There's John. He is interacting with all of those powerful of the world, those Roman soldiers who weren't exactly known for being nice people, those tax collectors who collected taxes on behalf of Rome in the Jerusalem countryside and then sent it off to Rome to fund building projects and armies and those things. Crowds themselves, mixed people, some people probably of extraordinary wealth and other people with little. In that society, folks who were enslaved, those people who were free, people certainly who were not citizens of Rome and didn't enjoy that protection. It's interesting how Mary sings of the world being turned around. And then there's John, who stands out in the wilderness and proclaims things like we heard tonight. 
He's a feisty guy, a little fiery. I don't, I can imagine how he would attract a bunch of crowds even out in the wilderness. But the idea that John is out in the wilderness itself is a turning. So if you dig into John's family tree, he's actually supposed to be in the temple. If you follow his line, not only is he a priest in the temple, which is really the center of the way in which the Roman world and the everyday people uh, sort of interacted, John was in line to be high priest. That is to say, he was in line to be in charge of that whole religious, societal, political machination that would be in cahoots with Rome. And so when John stands out in the wilderness and says, you brood of vipers, he knows what he's talking about. And I find it fascinating that there isn't, of all the different accounts that we have of the, of the birth of Jesus, Mark, Matthew, Luke, even John has an account. It's a little bit different. No one, not a single one of all those authors, for all the things that, all the details that are different, not a single one of them can tell the story of Jesus, the means by which in Mary's song the world is going to be turned around without telling the story of John the baptizer. I've always puzzled over it because it doesn't quite make sense. And uh, not to go into a lecture, but theologians have spent a whole lot of time because there are some problems with John the baptizer and Mark's gospel that Luke fixes and Matthew fixes. I just wonder, why didn't they just cut them out altogether? Well, like so many things in life, those things that are so easy to cut out, well, maybe they do, in fact, have some truth in them. And I wonder, I wonder, dear friends, if those of us who wait this day, sing this day, Mary's song of the world being turned around, the prayer, in fact, that we pray every time we gather for Jazz Vespers, every time we gather together as a community to pray for our world in so much need, I wonder if the reason why Luke and Matthew, and Mark, and John couldn't tell the Jesus story without the story of John the baptizer is just the same as true today. Because for those of us who are praying for this world to be turned around, yes, it is by the power of Almighty God, as Mary sings. But dear friends, be under no illusion. God does not do that alone, but with people like you and me. John raised up his voice. He was the voice of the high priest who stood out in the wilderness, and he made that promise known to those who would go see him. And we do that too. We're teachers, we're lawyers, we're actors, we're singers, we're musicians, we're pastors. Whatever it is you do in life, know too that like John the baptizer, you do not simply proclaim, but you pave that way for that promise of Mary to, in fact, come to be in our world, to, as we say this time of year, take flesh in us. That's what Emmanuel means. God is with us. So sing. Sing Mary's song. Sing it on your hearts. Take it home tonight. And take to your voice, like John's voice, crying out in the wilderness, the voice of us all, confident that this promise of God, that this promise Mary sings of, is in fact coming to be in our world with people, people like you and me. And in that spirit, I invite you to join your hearts in praying either aloud or in silence. We pray for the church. We will pray for 
Our earth is common home. We will pray, pray for the peoples and nations and tribes of this world, those who are vulnerable. We'll pray for our beloved dead, trusting, knowing that however we pray this night, God hears us. For the body of Christ, renew your church, O God, to proclaim good news to the world. Bless this gathering and aliven our song as we join our voices in joy. Particularly this day, we ask you to pour out your blessing on Pastor Fabian Arias, renewing in him the gift of the Holy Spirit, the work of ministry in your church as he celebrates his 17th anniversary of ordination. For all the earth, we repent for the harm we do to the body of creation. By the power of your spirit, O oh God, teach us to live in love and in union with all of life. For the peoples, nations, and tribes of this world, raise up prophets among us who warn against captivity to greed and point to the freedom found in generosity and justice. For all who are vulnerable, you come near to us in times of worry Gather the outcast, cradle us in your arms, and show us, O oh God, how to trust you and not be afraid. For this community of faith, grant us wisdom and discernment and joy in our life together. For all who have died, particularly those we name now, either aloud or in our hearts. We give you thanks for these, our departed loved ones, and all your servants who show us grace. Keep us steadfast in faith until we too make our home in you with Mary the Theotokos in Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, Lucy and all the saints. Rejoice, the Lord is near. Rejoice, the Lord is near. Rejoice, rejoice, the Lord is near. Sad as a 
as a gypsy serenading the moon. Oh, Skylark, I don't know if you can find these things, but my love is gliding. You see them anywhere? Won't you lead me there? Serenading the moon, oh skylark. I don't know if you can find these things, but my love is gliding on your wings. So if you see them. Won't you lead me As you go forth into this night, go with the blessing of Almighty God, the one who created us, redeems us, inspires us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, both this night and always. Amen. Wonderful things that you get out of life there are four And there may not be many but nobody needs any more Of the many facts making the list of life One means the same And to relax knowing the gist of life It's truth you need There are second is honor and happiness makes number three when you put them together, you know just how happy we'll be. Baby, so in truth, honor and happiness. And one thing more, there is only one thing that we need in life to make them
wonderful things that you get out of life, there are four. And though there may not be many, but nobody needs any more. Of the many facts making the gist of life, but truth takes the lead. And you can relax knowing the gist of life, but it's truth you need. And the second is honor and happiness makes number three. If you put them together, you know just how happy we'll be. Baby, so it's truth, honor, and happiness. There's nothing more out of all the wonderful, marvelous things that make them four.